Madam President, when President Trump declared a national emergency over the crisis along our southern border, it was immediately met with expressions of concern, some, in my view, illegitimate, others quite legitimate. As I've said in the past, I'll repeat again, this, what we are doing here today is no one's first choice, but it's useful to recall how we find ourselves at this point today. Of course, when it comes to funding, when it comes to appropriations, Congress holds the purse. That's why each year Congress receives the President's budget request for the upcoming fiscal year, just as we did earlier this week. But even though in the President's budget he outlines his priorities, my experience here in the Senate is most presidential budgets, while they are an expression of the President's priorities, are dead on arrival. It then falls to us in the Senate and the House to look at his request and to work on a compromise budget and appropriations process and fund the operations of the federal government. This process is arduous, it's time consuming, and it's often frustrating, but it's the way the system is supposed to work. As all Americans can attest, what we've seen over the last few months looks like something very different. The refusal of Democrats in the House and the Senate to engage in negotiations on border security funding has led us to a 35-day government shutdown. Despite the clear message from border security experts, despite seeing the humanitarian crisis at the border described by President Obama in 2014 get many times worse, our Democratic colleagues decided to play politics instead of dealing with the problem. We heard the Speaker of the House call border barriers immoral. The minority leader here in the Senate said there would be no additional money for physical barriers along the border. But they know, just like I know, that back in 2006 and 2008, the Secure Fence Act was passed with broad bipartisan support, including support from then Senator Barack Obama, then Senator Hillary Clinton, and Senator Chuck Schumer, currently the Democratic leader in the Senate, who now feels like this president should not get any additional money to fund border security measures that the president believes are an important response to the crisis we see at the border. My preference would be for the normal appropriations process to be used. But when your negotiating partners refuse to take a seat at the table, normal goes out the window. Our colleagues across the aisle left the president with few options to fund what he believed were so important for the nation's security. And that's what left, led us to this situation. Enter the 1986 legislation, the National Emergencies Act. So what the president did is he asked his lawyers to look at what other authority under congressionally passed laws signed by previous presidents might I have to access additional funds. And his lawyers pointed to the 1976 National Emergencies Act, which have granted presidents since that time broad powers to reprogram funding previously appropriated by Congress. So this idea that somehow this is an unconstitutional act by this president is simply wrong. Congress has given the president this authority. Now, they may regret it today, or they may disagree that this is an emergency, or they may disagree with the way the president wants to spend the money to secure the border, but clearly the president is using authorities that Congress has previously granted, not just to him, but to all presidents since 1976. But as my father liked to remind me growing up, one of the things he always told me is hindsight is always 2020. Our predecessors did not anticipate the fights we would be having today, which are largely contrived and unnecessary. We should be working together to solve these problems, not engaged in a zero-sum game of political brinksmanship. That's what brought us to where we are today. But I think it's appropriate to look at 
what Congress did in 1976. And in a prospective sort of way, ask ourselves, have we delegated too much authority to presidents since that time? There are literally 123 statutory authorizations that can be invoked under the National Emergency Act. 123 times Congress said a president, upon the declaration of a national emergency, can reprogram money that Congress has appropriated. 123 times. That was a shock, not only to me, but I dare say to virtually all of our colleagues here in the Senate. Many of these statutory grants of authority are exceedingly broad and cover everything from the military to public health to federal pay schedules. With these broad authorities already part of the law, the emergency powers provision could be viewed as a failsafe for an agenda that the administration, AM administration, alone is pushing. Let's say, hypothetically, a future president decides there's a need to declare a national emergency over climate change. Maybe they decide that this is a way to enact the Green New Deal being pushed by our, some of our colleagues across the, side, across the aisle. Considering the potential scope and scale in which these powers could be abused in the future and this over-delegation of authority that Congress has done 123 times, I believe that we should take a look at the National Emergencies Act once we vote today and have a fulsome debate and discussion about whether this is really the sort of delegation of powers that the Founding Fathers intended when they said distinct separated powers should be given to each branch of the government, the legislative, the judicial, and the executive branch. But it's clear that the President is operating within the authority that Congress has given to him. You don't have to like it. You don't have to agree with it, but it's clear that the president is operating within the authority Congress delegated to him. Rather than talking in circles and debating that fact, I think our discussion should focus on the structure of emergency powers moving forward. I believe there's a need to rein back in some of the authority that Congress has delegated to presidents, just as an institutional concern, as a constitutional matter which is why I'm co-sponsoring a bill that's been introduced by our colleague, Senator Lee, which gives Congress a stronger voice in processes under the National Emergencies Act. That bill will now be referred to the Homeland Security Committee. Chairman Johnson has said he will give that bill a hearing and then a markup, and then I would expect that at some point that legislation will make its way to the Senate floor where we'll have a debate, and a vote. But the proposal would, would allow the president to maintain his statutory powers to declare an emergency, but that declaration would end after 30 days unless Congress affirmatively votes to extend it. This would maintain a president's ability to provide funding during national emergencies while restoring Congress's proper authority under Article I of the Constitution. I think this is an honest, an important effort to ho hopefully help us prevent, prevent us from ending up in this predicament in the future. But the real cause of where we are today, Madam President, is just, pol it's just politics. Ms. Pelosi deciding that building any border barrier was immoral after Democrats and Republicans had not made that particularly political decision in the past. In fact, it had been bipartisan that we did support as one tool in the toolbox for Border Patrol, in addition to technology and personnel, some physical barriers. So rather than scolding the President of the United States for exercising statutory authority that Congress has already given him, we should try to work together to solve these problems rather than engaging in the kind of political brinksmanship that brings us here today. And we should fix should it be the will of Congress, this delegation, massive delegation of authority, not just to this president, but to any president since 1976. But I have to disagree with our colleague from Colorado and others 
who suggests that the, what's happening at the border is not serious. And by the way, I haven't heard any of them suggest any alternative solution. Perhaps instead of border patrol securing the border, we ought to have police officers at the border directing traffic, waving people through to their chosen destination. I think that would be a terrible mistake, but that seems to be the only alternative that our friends across the aisle are offering to this humanitarian crisis and emergency at the border. Last month, 76,000 people illegally crossed the border and were apprehended by U.S. Customs and Border Protection, making this an 11-year high. So rather than 76,000 people in one month, which our Democratic colleagues don't seem to think is a problem, let's say next month it's 150,000 or 300,000 or 600,000. As long as we have this attraction for people from other countries to come to the United States, and if they pay the fee to the criminal organizations to transport them here, and they will successfully be able to make their way into the United States, they're going to keep coming. It's clear this problem isn't going away, and it's overwhelming the communities along the border as well as the federal government's ability to, to deal with them. And then I remember what the director of the Customs and Border Protection said. He said, when the Border Patrol is handing out diapers and juice boxes to children coming across the border, the drug cartels will exploit that and move their poison into the United States. I'll just remind my colleagues that more than 70,000 Americans died of drug overdoses last year alone. A substantial amount of it was synthetic opioids in the form of fentanyl, but a lot of it had to do with the heroin that's made its way from Mexico into the United States. 90% of the heroin consumed in the United States comes from Mexico. So while the Border Patrol is handing out diapers and juice boxes, the drug cartels are moving heroin, fentanyl, methamphetamine into the United States to its destination and getting rich in the process. Well, we know that border security is complicated, and it's not just about security. It's about facilitating legitimate trade and travel and commerce. Last year alone, there was $300 billion worth of commerce that took place just at Texas ports of entry with Mexico, $300 billion. That supports an awful lot of American jobs. But the, but the terrain in the 1,200-mile border between Texas and Mexico varies significantly. What works well in one sector does not work well in another. And what I continue to hear from my constituents, and elect including elected officials at the border, that if this is the Border Patrol telling us what we they need in order to succeed to, to do the job we have asked them to do, we're all in. But if this is just politics and elected officials in Washington trying to micromanage the solution along the border, we're skeptical, is what they tell me. And I don't blame them. So I think we need to take action to adequately fund our border security missions. And I hope our discussions in the coming months will be more productive than they have been so far this year. I will vote against the resolution of disapproval today and encourage my colleagues to instead focus our energy on reforming the legislation that got us into this situation to begin with. Madam President. The Senator from New Hampshire. Madam President, I'm here this afternoon to support the resolution that would terminate the President's unconstitutional emergency declaration. It's a declaration that would take money from critical military construction projects to fund a costly and ineffective border wall. Congress did not provide these funds for a border wall that President Trump promised Mexico would pay. Rather, we specifically allocated these resources that are being talked about to be used by the President for the wall to ensure that our military is ready and capable and that our service members receive the support they deserve. 
The President's attempt to circumvent Congress by making the military pay for his border wall jeopardizes our national security and does a disservice to our men and women in uniform. That's why the House passed the legislation on the Senate floor today and why I introduced legislation with my colleagues in the Senate to terminate the emergency declaration. The resources that Congress has provided support military construction projects in New Hampshire and across the country. Those projects often provide necessary infrastructure improvements that enable our service members to accomplish their mission. Several of those projects that are, I think, potentially um, being reviewed for adding to the list to take money from are at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. It's one of the many installations that face potential cuts in funding if this emergency declaration is executed. Now, Congress has already approved funding for several projects at the shipyard and at our public shipyards around the country that support critical submarine maintenance, and any disruption to funding of those projects could lead to costly delays and to a reduction in military readiness because they would derail carefully laid plans to upgrade aging infrastructure. And delays in projects that support the shipyard's mission threaten to exacerbate the Navy's already high demand for submarine maintenance and the projected submarine shortfall in the coming years. I recently sent a letter to President Trump and spoke with um, the leaders at DOD urging them to protect these important projects at the shipyard. But the only way to ensure that these projects move forward is to terminate the emergency declaration. In addition to projects at the shipyard, the emergency declaration could also impact New Hampshire's National Guard readiness centers, which are in desperate need of modernization. A 2014 report from the Army National Guard ranked the condition of New Hampshire's National Guard facilities 51 out of 54 states and territories. Our National Guard has been forced to shoulder an enormous burden since the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Service members have often faced multiple deployments, and they've still had to respond to national, natural disasters at home and to other personal crises. The New Hampshire National Guard can't afford further delays to the readiness center improvements because of President Trump's emergency declaration. These military construction projects in New Hampshire are at risk because President Trump wants to score political points by building a wall rather than focusing on the border security proposals that actually worked. And I was disappointed to hear my colleague from Texas accusing Democrats of not supporting border security, because in fact, virtually everyone here has supported significant border security proposals in the past, including targeted fencing in vulnerable areas where we know that that fencing or barrier can make a difference. We've supported more Border Patrol agents, better surveillance and screening technologies, and increased security at the ports of entry. And coming from a state where we have a huge challenge with the opioid epidemic, where we understand the impact of having cocaine and fentanyl and other drugs come across our border, I also know that the best way to interdict those drugs is through the ports of entry, that's where most of them are coming from. In a recent bipartisan budget agreement, Congress provided, I supported along with the majority of the Senate, nearly $15 billion for Customs and Border Protection, including $1.3 billion for physical infrastructure in vulnerable areas along the southern border. The reality at our borders is that the vast majority of drugs and contraband come through the ports of entry. They don't come through the areas between the ports of entry. In the past two months alone, law enforcement officials have made the largest cocaine seizure in the past 25 years at Newark, New Jersey, and the largest fentanyl seizure ever at any port of entry in the U.S. in Arizona. But despite this reality, President Trump insists on having our military bear the burden to fulfill his campaign promise.
and his insistence that the situation at the border requires the military to pay for his wall runs counter to what I've heard in the Senate Armed Services Committee from our military leaders. In a recent Senate Armed Services Committee hearing, General O'Shaughnessy, commander of U.S. Northern Command, testified that the threats to our nation from our southern border are not military in nature, and that he has never advised the President that a border wall is necessary to support his mission. Just this morning, we heard testimony at our SASC hearing with Secretary Shanahan and Joint Chiefs Chairman Dunford that we have more troops on our southern border with Mexico than we have in all of Europe on our east, Europe's eastern border with Russia, and we have almost as many on our southern border, a quarter as many as we have on the DMZ on the border with North Korea. Now, by any measure, North Korea and Russia pose a, pose a greater threat to our national security than Mexico. It's a policy that does not make sense. Yet we have more troops on the southern border now than we do in Eastern Europe and in Syria. The fact is, the men and women at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard and at the New Hampshire National Guard, the men and women who are serving in our military across this country, they should not be forced to sacrifice readiness for an unnecessary border wall that takes funding away from projects that this Congress has already approved that are going forward. I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to protect Congress's constitutional authority and defend our national security by supporting the resolution to terminate President Trump's emergency declaration. Thank you, Madam President. I yield the floor. From the outset of this process, I've had two objectives. One, 